right, hello everyone. For those who don't know me, my name is Catherine and I'm going to be presenting today on child and adolescent psychiatry and on addiction psychiatry. So those are the topics that we'll be covering. Um, yeah, they are good areas to know about. They're sort of not your main psychiatric areas in medicine, but you definitely can get OSCEs in some of these bigger ones and there are a lot of MCQs as well. So... Starting with child and adolescent psychiatry. So, fun fact, 50% of mental health problems actually begin before you turn 18. They actually begin before you turn 14. So, it's a big area of psychiatry. Often people aren't diagnosed until they're adults, but the symptoms do present early. The head screen, I would hope most of you have heard of this by now. Um, so, H is for home. So when you're taking a history from a teenager, and this is in psych and this is also just in paediatrics, you want to do a head screen as well. Um, you want to ask who they live with. If their parents are divorced, you want to ask about both households, all of their siblings. And you want to get a sense here of sort of who lives with them at home and how their relationships are with them. So do you get along with mum and dad? Do mum and dad get along with each other? Is there a lot of fighting in the household? Um, so you're looking for sort of protective factors like, oh, mum and I get along really well, or risks like, oh, there's a lot of fighting in the household, no one's ever home, I'm neglected, um, <laughs> those sort of things. Education and employment for E. So the two main things with education is like social, like friends, and also their schoolwork. So do they have friends? Are they being bullied? Do they feel like comfortable going to school or are they very nervous because of they're having issues with their peers? And in terms of their study, um, they might have always been a child who studied, um, struggled with study, or they may be a child who, because they're now struggling with mental health problems, is having a lot of issues with their work. And that's something that, as a psychiatrist, you can work with the school to help. Activities, sort of the main idea of that one is working out hobbies, which can be quite protective. So do they have any sports they do? Do they do them with friends? Is this a sort of safe space for them? Drugs is the same as with an adult. You want to work out smoking, alcohol, illicit drugs, and usage of that. Sexuality, the two sort of aspects are, um, are they in a relationship? Are they sexually active? And is that causing some stress for them? And also, just they may not have decided yet if they're interested in guys or girls, and that can also cause a lot of tension as a teenager. And suicide depression. This kind of depends on the head screen. Like, if you get a STEM where it's a teenager who's overdosed, you're probably going to start with that a bit sooner in your history. But if you haven't covered that yet when you're seeing a teenager, you want to ask those questions as well. And, yeah, keeping in mind as you go through these that you kind of want to have a mental list of protective factors and risks, which you can bring up at the end when you're explaining your diagnosis to the examiner. Risk assessment, um, I think this is quite a nice list. This is what the Monash Children's Hospital uses for all their adolescents that come through an ED will be asked, if who come in for a psychiatric reason, will be asked to fill out this. Um, a lot of them are similar to adults, but there are sort of some key ones that are different that will look really good if you mention in an OSCE. So one is cognitive or developmental related harm. Um, so they might be at more risk. So if you have a child who, say, is autistic or has an intellectual disability, they can be much more vulnerable. Um, there's also, obviously, abuse is a big thing with children. Um, you want to check for that. Since they're living at home, they're particularly vulnerable in that sense. Difficulties with engagement. So sometimes you might have a kid who's really well aware of their mental health, but if you have a family that's never going to bring them into appointments, then they're at a high risk of not getting picked up. So it's a really good one to mention you've checked for that. Um, and then, yes, yeah, social risks. Are they, do they financially have enough money? Are they being fed? All those sort of basic things that can really affect... So autism, first big condition, um, there's a lot of like criteria for this. I don't think you'd specifically need to know every single one of those points, but I think getting kind of an idea of the three main ideas is, will be enough. So one is their deficits in social communication. So you want to, in an OSCE, you'd want to ask, you know, how does your child go with other peers? Do they have friends? Do they like play with them. So like imaginative play is a big thing that children with autism struggle with. So how do they go with that? Um, can they keep friends as well? Like sometimes they might be okay talking to other kids, but they just sort of don't have the skills to maintain friendships. Nonverbal communication, they might just not respond as other children would. And yeah, just having sort of the concept in your mind of socially they struggle. 
And the other big area is the restricted and repetitive patterns of behaviour and interests. So that might be they might have sort of one big thing that they really, really like and they're not really interested in anything else. They also, the repetitiveness, like they have to take the same route to school is one you commonly hear as an example. So if mum takes a different route, that leads to a lot of upset. They need really strict patterns or they get distressed. Um, so that's sort of the other side of things. So you want to make sure you always screen for both those sort of sides of autism. And it's also, autism should generally present quite young. So if it's a 12-year-old, um, you'd expect to have a history of these sort of things since they were much younger. Risk factors, so more common in males, more common with a family history. Um, in terms of genetic conditions, fragile X is the most common one to present with autism. Management, there's not really one thing for management for autism, but I think, I don't know if anyone's mentioned yet today, but a big thing with, uh, with fourth year is that in your OSCEs for management, you don't want to just name like that one drug as you can in third year. You really do need to talk through sort of all the steps in management, you know, looking at the sort of biopsychosocial model. Um, autism is a good example, yeah, because there isn't one set thing. But you want to do hearing and vision testing, since that can affect communication. You need a multidisciplinary team. Behaviour modification is very useful, so having reward systems. So this is to help them sort of with certain things they struggle with to encourage them to do those things. Um, and then they get sort of prizes. Um, education either in a special school or with extra help in a regular school. So you want a personalised sort of program that really focuses on the socialising and things that they struggle with. Um, and you really want to involve the family in this too because you kind of do need to be working on this in all aspects of their life. And then depending on the severity of the autism, for some children they're fairly normal and for other children they can really struggle with basic communication and they may need sort of transitional planning as they get older to help them progress into adulthood. NDS is good to mention, anyone with a disability, good support, parental support. And it's good to know that there's like a lot of crossover with autism. So a lot of them may also have intellectual disability, ADHD, conduct disorders, depression. And up to 30% have epilepsy. So keep that in mind in case that comes up as a question. So ADHD, for this one you only need one of inattention or hyperactivity and impulsivity. You may have both, but you only need one for the diagnosis. Again, I think learning every single one of those points <coughs> is probably not necessary. Um, you can kind of cut it down to sort of understanding the concept, and as long as you can ask a few of those points, you should be fine. So for inattention, yeah, it's basically they're just careless, they're really distractible, they lose things, they forget things really quickly, they can't concentrate in class, they're really disorganised. Yeah, they basically just can't keep track of things. And for the hyperactivity, um, yeah, again, it should be pretty obvious. It's a kid who's hyperactive in terms of physically. They might run around a lot. They're jumping out of the chair when they're not supposed to. Um, they're also, with talking, they're really loud. They talk over other children. They might interrupt you when you're talking. Um, and they can kind of appear impatient, um, so people may not realise that it's actually a condition because they can just look kind of irritating when really it's just because they have this constant drive. Uh, also, you were diagnosed this generally in age under 12. So the key bits for management for this are firstly psychoeducation. You want to make sure the parents and the teachers all have a good understanding. It's a big issue with ADHD that these children get punished a lot, especially at yeah, schools and at home because the parents think they're really disruptive. But actually because it's quite hard for them to control this, they can end up developing low self-esteem, which is quite sad. Uh, behavioural therapy is big, so medication is not recommended in under four-year-olds or it kind of depends with sources. Some sources say under five-year-olds. So basically, if you've got a young child, you want to start with behavioural therapy. And then if they're a bit older, you would probably do behavioural and you would start a medication. So the main medication is methylphenidate, which is a stimulant. can cause a few side effects, so they can get a bit of nausea, a bit of um, headache, abdominal discomfort. Um, and occasionally psychosis or tics. It does require regular monitoring every month, so it it's kind of does require a fair bit of follow-up, um, but it can be very helpful. And it's also the other big symptom that people notice is, so methylphenidate lasts about sort of six hours for the full effect, so by the end of the day, the medication's weaning off and parents might say, oh, you know, Johnny becomes really disruptive in the evening. Um, it's good to explain to them that that's just because the way the medication works. 
and yeah, treatment of coexisting conditions. Intellectual disability, it's not something I've really heard of coming up much in the multiple choice or the OSCEs, but it is a green topic for you guys. So I think to have a basic understanding of the main bits is good. So the two sort of big areas are intellectual, intellectually they struggle. So to diagnose that you need a clinical assessment and you need to do standardized intelligence testing. Um, and so yeah, that intellectual function deficit may appear and sort of, you know, they can't plan things and process things, their problem solving is behind, um, they don't have sort of age appropriate um, judgment. And then the other big area is their adaptive functioning. So basically with their sort of ADLs and their roles in society, they can't fulfill those. And that's going to be unique to a child's sort of cultural setting and social setting, sort of what would be expected of a child at that age. But if they're within their setting very clearly, not say like a six-year-old who can't dress themselves at all would be behind in that sense. Um, yeah, so those are the two areas you would want to check for in a child. And again, it, they have to develop during the developmental period, so it's not a later in life onset. So first question, six-year-old Sam is brought to his GP after his teacher stated some concerns. She reported that he did not socialise with other children in the class and he spent his lunch times collecting ants and completed all his projects on them. When sport class was cancelled one day, he became highly agitated. Does anyone want to call out the answer? <coughs> A little louder. ASD. ASD, yes. So this is an autistic child. So yeah, you can see the sort of social aspect coming out. He doesn't have friends. His communication skills are probably struggling. He's got the fixed focus on the ants. And yeah, they have the rigidity. He doesn't cope well when the sort of daily structure is changed. Other things that might be commonly appear in a STEM is the child, as I said before, who doesn't participate in an imaginative play, or also the child who has to line up all the pencils in their colour order, things like that. Right. Four-year-old Alice caught attention at preschool due to impulsive aggression. Her mother says she is constantly active, never complies with requests, and gets bored of activities quickly. At church, she refuses to stay in her chair, which embarrasses her mother greatly. Alice is constantly distracted by noises around the room whilst you are seeing her. Which of the following is the best treatment? Yeah, so because Alice is four, we wouldn't want to jump to methylphenidate quite yet. So we'll start with behavioural therapy and then down the line, if that's not enough, then we can add on medication. Yeah. Okay, yes? Um, I'm not sure what the major reason is, but it's a combination. It's definitely, yeah, it can affect their growth. They do get the sort of the headaches and abdominal pain. They do have quite a few side effects. And the research does show that behavioural therapy alone can be effective in the younger ones. So there's no harm in sort of starting with that. Yeah, eating disorders. So there's a few different eating disorders, and I've got a table at the end to help you differentiate them. But we'll start with bulimia. So in bulimia, you get recurrent episodes of binge eating. And in order to compensate for this, they will do things like purging. They might then fast. They might take laxatives or emetics. Um, it's, so, yeah, it's characterised by the binge eating, a sense of lack of control. It's incredibly stressful for the person. And then these compensatory compensatory behaviours. And so this should be happening at least once a week for three months. So as with everything, time frames are important. They also have um, a lot of influence on their self-evaluation based on their weight. The other key thing with this is it doesn't occur when anorexia is happening. So if you have a STEM and it looks like anorexia and it looks like bulimia, it's going to be anorexia because you can't diagnose the bulimia. For anorexia, the key thing is the low weight. So you can't diagnose anorexia if they have a normal weight. They must be below weight. In adults, that will be that they have a BMI below 18.5. But in children, you have to go via the sort of the growth charts. It's a bit different in children. Um, so yeah, if you have a stem and it's low weight and not eating, it's probably going to be anorexia. Um, but the other elements, so there's three elements, the other elements are fear of gaining weight, which they may tell you they're scared, or it might just be very clear from their behaviours that they're scared of gaining weight. Um, and again, they have a really 
poor sense of self-esteem based on their weight. So they don't recognise that they're below weight. They say, no, I still look ugly. Or they say, my weight's not that low. They don't realise how low their weight is or the consequences of that, even if they're having symptoms. So they can be a restricted type or a binge eating purging type. So again, it's important to keep in mind, they may be binge eating, but it could still be anorexia. So overwhelmingly, this is seen in females. Um, the main age of onset is 14 to 18 year olds, so you get a lot of teenagers presenting with this. But it can happen up to 40, so don't cross it out in an adult either. Classically, like in an MCQ, you're going to get this child who's always been a perfectionist, always had to do well in school. They might be in an area like ballet or they might be a gymnast or a model, somewhere that's really focused on the perfect body and weight loss. They often, these children as well, they might have sort of parents who either had an eating disorder or just have sort of very rigid sort of dietary requirements that they follow, which can often sort of then go to the extreme in the child. And then a family history of other mental health disorders also. There's also a lot of physical symptoms you get in anorexia, which are not covered by the DSM criteria. So these are important to check for in an OSCE. So because they've got the low weight, they get really tired, they can't concentrate in class. Commonly, their first presentation might be because they start fainting regularly, and so they get brought in by mum who's worried they're fainting. Their periods will stop, so you always want to ask about that. Um, and when it's more severe, they can get sort of cardiac arrhythmias, arrhythmias and seizures as well. In terms of differentiating them, I've made a little table to sort of summarise. But sort of the key things you'd want to look for in a MCQ would be for anorexia, you're going to have the below normal BMI. For bulimia, you have the binge eating, but you also have the compensation to avoid weight gain. Whereas in binge eating disorder, which is another sort of smaller condition, you binge eat, but they don't compensate for it. So they often end up sort of being overweight because they're eating the extra food. But yeah, that's a little summary. In terms of questions to ask for an eating disorder, there's quite a few that are quite specific, so I've written a list of the ones I learnt. So you want to ask their current weight and their ideal weight, any recent changes in their weight, the highest and lowest weights they've ever reached, and sort of what things they're doing in order to make sure they lose weight, how often they weigh themselves, so often if they've got this preoccupation with their weight, they'll be weighing themselves like three times a day. Their meal pattern, which is easiest to just ask, tell me what you ate yesterday and go through every meal, including snacks, with them. Their attitudes, so towards food, and towards their weight, towards their body shape and towards eating. You want to make sure you always screen for symptoms. You want to ask about their periods, family history and all the other sort of usual questions too. In terms of if you've got an eating disorder exam, firstly, of course, you want to work out their BMI. Then you want to do their vital signs. So in anorexia, you'll find that everything is low. Uh, mouth examination. So in bulimia, you can get sort of eroded dental enamel on your teeth, which is from having the vomiting come up if you're purging afterwards. It can actually erode your teeth. Um, and also, you can find um, arrhythmias in both types, hyperactive bowel sounds. That's because if you're not eating as much, your gut isn't getting <laughs> stimulated to obviously digest, so they won't have as much noise in there. Um, arrhythmias and having a look at their skin, so the scars on the dorsum of the hand, that's another buzzword, um, which is, again, it's for if you're putting your fingers in your mouth to purge, you can get scarring from that. I have seen little practice stems around that have symptoms like these in the stem, so they're good to know. Um, and any signs of dehydration. You can also ask them to do a sit-up or a squat, which is just looking for weakness. In terms of investigations, I won't read all these out, but these are the investigations, so learn those. In terms of management, uh, firstly, you want to consider if they need to be admitted or not. So there are specific criteria, but I think it's fine if you have a general gist that if they've got something like if they're having seizures, if they have arrhythmias, if they're fainting multiple times a day, then they're going to need a medical admission. And if they're well enough that they don't need to be medically treated, then they can have a psychiatric admission or be managed in the community. So for adolescents with anorexia, family-based therapy and CBT enhanced are recommended. So CBT enhanced is a special type of CBT that was specifically designed for bulimia. It also is effective in anorexia. And that's the same. So for bulimia in adolescence, you would also start with family-based therapy and then consider CBT enhanced. For adults with anorexia, CBT enhanced. 
and also for everyone with anorexia, you first got to consider refeeding present prevention. So refeeding is a condition where when they eat too much food too quickly, um, when they're starting to go on meal plans and eat again, they can actually get really unwell from that because they get quite severe electrolyte disturbances. So, you know, if you get a patient who comes to ED first, you want to check their electrolytes and make sure you correct them before you start putting them on a meal plan. And then you're going to have a special meal plan with dietitian involvement to make sure you slowly graduate them back up to a normal diet. For bulimia, for adults, you want to do CBT enhanced and also interpersonal therapy has been found useful. And there's no risk of refeeding with bulimia, but you do still want to have that meal support and have dietitian input. Um, I've listed the, the complications down the bottom. So for anorexia, as I said, refeeding, anemia and electrolyte imbalances. Infertility is an issue. So you can become temporarily infertile while you have anorexia. And if you're anorexic for long enough, you, this can actually be a more permanent thing. So it's quite serious. Mental health problems, pregnancy complications. Their bones can become really weak because they haven't been having calcium growth issues, so in, if you have like a 13 year old, that's a bit of a concern that they may not actually reach their full growth potential, fractures, and you can have various organ failures. For bulimia, the risks, there aren't as many, but the big ones are sort of, you can get pancreatitis, um, you can get also Mallory Weiss tears and esophageal ruptures, which is obviously, if they're, again, if they're purging, they can do a lot of damage to their throat if that's happening regularly, and well, for both of them, there's a risk of suicide. So yeah, it's important to keep in mind that mortality is not that uncommon with eating disorder. So it is a very serious condition medically as well as psychiatrically. So for the rest of the child and adolescent conditions you have, you're not likely to get them, I wouldn't think, in an OSCE. But there are a lot of multiple choice questions I like to give you which sort of differentiate between these. So it's sort of a spot diagnosis. So for avoidant restrictive food intake disorder, you have sort of the low weight like with anorexia, but they're not scared about gaining weight and they don't have an abnormal perception of their own body. Pika is the one you kind of learn about with iron deficiency, but it's where they eat inappropriate foods, like they might eat sand or dirt or ice for greater than a month. Rumination disorder is where they repetitively regurgitate food for over a month and there's not really any clear cause. So it's commonly seen in children with an intellectual disability. And they don't really know why it happens, but yeah, they just keep regurgitating their food. For oppositional defiant and conduct disorder, it's good to think of it in sort of a spectrum. So you start with oppositional defiant and then it can develop into conduct disorder and then it can develop into antisocial personality disorder as an adult. So oppositional defiant is when basically it's just a difficult child. They get angry with their parents and teachers. They get irritable. They argument a lot. They're really defiant. Um, you would expect this sort of to present in sort of two different areas as well. Like it's not just with their siblings at home, it's happening at school and other places too. Then conduct disorder sort of when that progresses and becomes a bit more severe and they're actually doing things like they're hurting other children or they're hurting animals, they're stealing things, they're destroying property. Basically they're sort of breaking rules and causing more trouble. And then well, you'll learn about antisocial later, but that's more severe again. They don't necessarily progress through the chain, but they commonly do. And then the last two, disinhibited social engagement disorder and reactive attachment disorder, are two sort of interrelated conditions. So for both of these, you have a young child who's basically had really insufficient care as a very young child. So it might be that, say, they have drug-using parents who never feed them or look after them or are very abusive, or they might have been in foster care since they were born. They might have a new sort of care each month so they've never had a chance to sort of form a secure relationship but basically there's just a really clear sort of sign that they haven't been cared for when they're little and so then they can go one end of the spectrum or the other basically so if they have disinhibited social engagement disorder then they're really friendly with strangers comfortable with strangers love strangers they don't feel the need to keep like checking back like you know how little kids often will like look at mum to be like oh is it okay if I go here or talk to this person they don't have a sense of that they just approach anyone with no sort of boundaries. And then the other end of the spectrum is they might develop reactive attachment disorder. So because they've never sort of had a stable carer, they just, they don't really trust people. They're very sort of withdrawn. They won't talk too much about their emotions or them, you know, they won't run and try and get a hug when they're sad about something. They just kind of quite keep to themselves. Yeah. Okay, a few more questions. 17-year-old Caitlin is brought to ED by her father over concerns about her losing weight. 
Caitlin claims that the real issue is that she's too fat and hates how big her stomach and hips look. She does not eat much during the week, although often binge eats on weekends with her friends, after which she purges. After this, she sits in her room scared she may gain weight. Her BMI is calculated to be 16. What is the most likely diagnosis? <coughs> Any takers? <coughs> yeah, so A, anorexia. Um, so it's a pretty obvious one, low weight, but yeah, just a emphasising the point of they can still be binge eating and have anorexia. Six-year-old Fabian is a new patient to your GP who presents with a cold. When you call his name in the waiting room, he runs over to hug you. His foster carer trails behind. After your appointment, he begins chatting to an old man in the waiting room and is stopped by his carer from following the man to get an ice cream from his car. <laughs> what is the most likely diagnosis? Yeah, F, so disinhibited social engagement disorder. So, yeah, this is a very classic sort of thing in a STEM is that the child runs to hug the doctor they've never met before. It's sort of demonstrating that. Yeah. A 14-year-old girl presents to her GP with her mother who is concerned that she is skipping school. The girl reports she hates school because she feels too sad to go, very tired, cannot concentrate, and states, I just don't enjoy it like I used to. Along with CBT, which of the following medications would be best for this child? Yeah. Um, so floxetine. I haven't actually covered this in the lecture, but I just wanted to emphasise that most of the treatment for sort of depression and such is the same in children. But with medication, the only one that has clear evidence that it works well and doesn't cause <coughs> side effects is floxetine. So always pick that one first in children. Okay, on to addiction medicine. So for addiction medicine, this is quite a big one because they can easily give you smoking or alcohol or sort of cannabis use as a combined sort of psych GP or psych women's as well for a lot of these. So I think it's a pretty likely one since you guys do have to have at least one combined station. I assume that's the same for your year. Um, but yeah, so in terms of the use disorder criteria in the DSM, the list is the same for all of the different drugs, basically. So X could be, insert whichever drug you're thinking of. Um, I think it's good to know a few of the things from the list. Like you might ask about cravings, you want to ask about how it's affecting their life at home, at work. The two big ones you definitely always want to ask about, especially if you're screening, is tolerance and withdrawal. So tolerance might be either they need larger amounts of the drug to have the drug work, or they're taking the same amount but they're not getting the sort of positive symptoms that they used to take it for. And withdrawal, they might actually have had withdrawal symptoms when they've tried to stop, or they might be too scared to stop because they know those symptoms are going to come. Now, you want to check for both those things, because they might say, oh, no, I've never had any withdrawal symptoms. But then if you ask further, they're like, oh, yeah, I don't want to risk stopping because I might get them. Alcohol intoxication is, I'm sure you all know what that looks like, but so they're aggressive, inappropriately sexual, or have poor judgments. And they have to have at least one of this specific list, so slurred speech, incoordination, unsteady gait, nystagmus, impaired attention or memory, and stupor or coma. The treatment is basically supportive. You want to make sure to mention you're going to monitor their blood alcohol content, air, monitor their airways, and monitor their consciousness. For alcohol withdrawal, after they've had um, prolonged alcohol use, so generally you won't see this in people who are under 30 because it has to have been for quite a few years that they've had heavy alcohol use, but you get two of the symptoms I've listed there. I'll let you read those later. Um, the symptoms will usually start within 24 hours of stopping the alcohol, but the biggest intensity day is day two. As a side note, if you're ever asked about like what day is the peak intensity for a substance, it's generally day two to three, like most things, but for alcohol it's two, but you can probably be pretty safe by saying around day two or three. Um, for alcohol withdrawal, it usually lasts four to five days, but it's important to tell a patient that they might have ongoing sort of anxiety and sleep difficulties for several months afterwards. And also it's good to note that the withdrawal won't begin until the blood alcohol content is pretty much zero. Complications, there's quite a few for alcohol which you do want to know about. So delirium tremens is a severe condition which is basically a really severe withdrawal. So it will present by day three to four after they finish drinking and they get really agitated, really restless, their tremors are much bigger, they get confused, they hallucinate, they have a lot of paranoia, and all their um, vital signs will go up. 
So there's a mortality of up to 15% because they can go into heart failure most commonly, also respiratory failure, and they can get pneumonia as well. Um, so you really do need to catch this early and treat it, and so you, the treatment is diazepam. If you have a patient who you suspect is going to develop this and is like starting to withdraw before day three to four, you might give diazepam sooner to prevent this from developing as well. In terms of Wernicke's encephalopathy and Korsakoff syndrome, this is a bit of a different um, process. So it's not to do with the withdrawal from the drug itself, but it's to do with having thiamine deficiency. Um, so thiamine is a substance that's often affected by alcohol. I won't go into the details of it, but basically anyone who's been dependent on alcohol for a really long time is at risk of this. And the management is just high-dose thiamine. You also want to make sure you give this for quite a while after you treat them because it's not like you can give one dose and fix it. They will have quite a deficiency that needs treating over several weeks to months. So the triad for Wernicke's encephalopathy is confusion, ophthalmoplegia, and gait ataxia. Learn those three, and that way if you get a STEM they're always, or a um, MCQ, they're always going to mention those three things or two of them plus a really clear history of alcohol abuse. Um, yeah, and so you want to give high dose thiamine. For Korsakoff syndrome, that's when they've sort of had this thiamine deficiency, but it's kind of too late to treat it. So it's quite a sad condition when you see patients in the wards with it because it can't be treated, and they just they have really poor memory from the past, and they're not good at forming new memories, and they have ongoing apathy. And there's not a lot you can really do for it. For management of alcohol withdrawal, as I said, you want to give thiamine. So you want to give this IM or IV specifically, not orally. You also want to give support, so education, monitoring. A low stimulus environment is really important for these patients. It can help sort of manage the symptoms of paranoia and such. And every patient who you have any suspicion about alcohol withdrawal, you want to put an alcohol withdrawal scale and be doing that regularly while they're in there, which is just monitoring their symptoms so that you can treat them appropriately. And yeah, as I said before, consider the need for diazepam if you think there's a risk of delirium tremens. And if they have severe liver disease, which they may well if they're an alcoholic, then you can use oxazepam instead. So in terms of alcohol dependence, there's a few different drugs you can give, but the pop most popular one is naltrexone. So the way this one works is it's an opioid receptor antagonist, and so it removes all the pleasurable effects of alcohol. Um, it's a really effective drug. The only group you can't use it in is if the patient is on sort of other opioids for pain because the way this works is it blocks the effects of opioids to stop the pleasure, but that can also stop pain meds from working, so then the patient might be in severe pain. Other options you have is disulfiram, which is not a really good drug. The way it works is it basically enhances all the bad symptoms you get from alcohol, so the flushing, vomiting, chest pain, but the problem is because it does that, if you do then go and have like 10 standards, you can get, it can be really dangerous and you can have seizures and arrhythmias. So it's not first line, but it can be effective and you want to make sure they're really eager to stop. You've got to make it clear to the patient that they cannot drink high amounts of alcohol in this or it's dangerous. And you want to make sure they sort of have like a supportive environment that's going to help them through it. The other drug that you sometimes see mentioned is a camprosate which can help control the long-term sort of anxiety and cravings that you can have. And sometimes uh, doctors will choose to combine a camprosate with naltrexone because that can be a bit more effective together. Smoking. So you might get, you could get a smoking history station or a smoking management station. I'm not sure if you learnt much about this yesterday in GP, but I've put up a list of risks and benefits. So if you've got a management station, you want to talk through with them all the risks and the benefits. If it's a women's station, you're going to want the pregnancy and the postnatal sort of risks to be discussed as well. In terms of treatment, you want to give them counselling is a really important part of it and get them to come back and see you regularly, do motivational interviewing, things like that. Nicotine replacement is a good option as a start. There's lots of different forms they can have it in, so it's good to sort of, as part of involving the patient in their own treatment, ask them, do you prefer patches or gum? Would you like something that you can inhale? Um, keep in mind, you can't give it to children or adolescents. You can't give it to women who are pregnant or breastfeeding or people with a serious cardiac history. There's two medications, bupropion and varenicline. So varenicline is the best option for managing smoking. So if you ever need to pick a drug, this would be the one you'd pick. Uh, it's a nicotine partial agonist, and it takes away those rewarding factors, but does cause a lot of nausea and insomnia. 
So if patients are having issues with this, you can use bupropion, which is not quite as effective, but doesn't have those, has a bit of a different side effect profile. For smoking withdrawal, the main sort of symptoms you see are irritability, anxiety, and difficulties with concentration. Um, another thing that patients often will mention is they're scared about weight gain, so it's good to tell them that actually you probably only gain two to three kilos over a year after quitting smoking on average, and that's due to an increased appetite, not inherently due to the smoking, so I encourage your patients to watch their diet. Because a lot of patients will tell you, oh no, I'm quite skinny now, I don't want to stop smoking. 50% uh, of patients will have this, so if they are quitting, it's important to tell them about it so that they're prepared. And again, the peak is at about two to three days. So for opioid intoxication, the key things are they have to have had an opioid and they have significant changes such as euphoria, apathy, dysphoria, psychomotor agitation and retardation and impaired judgment. The sort of triad of opioid intoxication that you'll see in MCQs are meiosis, so um, constricted pupils, and respiratory depression and sedation. Um, the blood things, the tests you want to do are blood gas, ECG, and chest X-ray. The chest X-ray is just because if they're respiratory depressed and they're sedated, you want to check that there's not another cause because you don't want to assume it's this. Um, in terms of management, always start with your doctor's ABCD. If you've got a patient who's sedated and breathing slowly, you want to make sure you don't miss anything else. Um, if you are sure it's opioids, airway management can be important. And the treatment medically is naloxone, which is an opioid antagonist. So the important thing with naloxone is that it does have a very short half-life. So you hear some sad stories about patients who've been given naloxone and then left and then the naloxone wears off and the effects of the opioids come back and they can still die from that. So you want to make sure to mention that you're going to monitor your patient regularly and give more naloxone as required. The other thing I wanted to point out is track marks is a thing that you would look for in these patients. That's what it looks like. So it's just when you can see that they've been um, taking an injectable um, opioid up the line of the vein. For opioid withdrawal, uh, the symptoms that you have are dysphoric mood, nausea and vomiting, muscle aches, lacrimation or rhinorrhea. You get dilated pupils instead of constricted, so you can kind of think of it as like the opposite. Diarrhea, yawning, fever and insomnia. The way I was taught to think about this is with an opioid withdrawal, you get secretions. So yeah, you have the vomiting, your eyes are tearing, your nose is running, you have diarrhea, basically everything's secreting. Uh, again, withdrawal is peaks at about one to three days post for heroin, uh, but this varies with different opioids. For management of opioid dependence, firstly, you want to start with counselling, CBT and social support. So they need a lot of ongoing support for this and it can be a really hard drug to quit. Often they need medication, sometimes for life. So depending on the severity of their addiction will guide you in which of their management options you take. So buprenorphine is the better one to start with. So it's a partial opioid agonist. The only problem with buprenorphine is if they have a really severe um, addiction, then this won't be enough for them. So it's only good for the sort of mild to moderate cases of dependence. It can be given in the form of Suboxone, some of you might have heard of. So it's combined with Naloxone in this case. And the way that works is because otherwise what patients sometimes do with these is they try to inject them to get the high. Um, so if you give it with Naloxone, the Naloxone doesn't have an effect when taken orally. But if they try to inject it, then the naloxone will counteract the buprenorphine, so they actually can't get a high from it. So that's a really good option. Then if they have a more severe addiction, you need to consider methadone. Unfortunately, most patients who take this won't be able to come off it ever, just because of the severity of their addiction. But it is a very effective option, and the idea is that, yes, it's still an opioid, but it has less severe side effects than heroin or whatever opioid they were addicted to beforehand. So it can cause a small risk of um, sort of arrhythmias and, as I said, tolerance. The other big risk with this one is they can overdose on it. So you, you're less likely to overdose on buprenorphine, but methadone is quite risky. So what doctors will often do is they make the patient go to the pharmacy every day just for one tablet, the idea being that they, it's much harder to hoard and take them all. So before they start, you have to do some investigations. You have to do LFTs, Hep B and C testing, and HIV and to inform them some of the side effects are confusion, sedation, nausea and vomiting, constipation and drowsiness. 
Another option you may hear mentioned is naltrexone. So that's the one I mentioned before with alcohol, and it can also be used for opioids. But you're generally going to start with buprenorphine or methadone. Cannabis is another one that's commonly seen. So the symptoms are sedation, euphoria, increased appetite, or the munchies, increased heart rate, reddening of eyes, and sort of other sort of mental impairments. They can also sort of have paranoia, panic attacks, and a lot of anxiety. Um, cannabis can precipitate a psychotic episode. They think this is only in people who are already more likely to develop it. Um, if it's used in pregnancy, sort of buzzwordy cannabis hyperemesis can cause and then difficulties for the child once they're born later on in life. There's not a treatment for this, it's just reassurance and symptomatic management. Amphetamines, I just wanted to put this one in because it's good for MCQs. Um, basically, the acronym to summarise the stimulant side effects is head, hallucinations, euphoria, ANS symptoms, and dilated pupils. So like with the opioid intoxication, it was constricted pupils. With the withdrawal, it's dilated. With amphetamines, it's dilated. It's good to know these because they can kind of help you cross things out really quickly as you're going through your list. That's pretty much the same symptoms you get for other stimulants like cocaine or MDMA as well. Okay, a few more questions. A 17-year-old male is brought to ED by his mother, who is concerned that he is drowsy and acting strangely. He is found to have a heart rate of 110 beats per minute, and the triage nurse notices he has red eyes. Which of the following is the most likely cause? Yeah, so a pretty simple one. Red eyes kind of tells you, but also the other signs. Cannabis. Anita is a 42-year-old woman who presents requesting medication as she is eager to quit alcohol. She has been drinking five to six standards a day for over 20 years. Her past history includes gallbladder removal in 2010, reflux, for which she is on isomeprazole, and had a car accident with spinal damage 15 years ago, for which she takes regular codeine. Anita lives at home with a supportive husband and kids. Which of the following options is best? Yeah, D, disulfiram. So the key bit here is because she's on the regular codeine for what sounds like long-term pain from her car accident, you couldn't give her... Naltrexone, and because she does have a supportive family at home, you can trial her on disulfiram. And that's all. Mm -hmm.